So um, I have nothing to disclose, uh, no financial arrangement related to anything we're going to be talking about today. Um, I'm going to be going over some of the, the best practice principles um, related to assessment and screening and outlining um, what is the difference between those two processes, um, what, why it's important, um, what's recommended in terms of uh, implementing the, the, those, those recommended models, and then um, wrap up with showing you some uh, commonly used screening tools that can be implemented in, in any set, uh, setting, primary care or specialty setting, um, and, and they are all public domain and, and, um, and freely available if, uh, if you're not already using them. Um, just a, a little bit of information to kind of ground this talk because I think it's, it's um, important to highlight the, the necessity of doing uni what's called universal screening is to recognize that the percentage of, of Americans um, uh, ages 12 and above um, are, are reporting high levels of, of alcohol use, heavy, heavy drinking, um, and illicit drug use. And so, so keeping in mind that at any given time, somebody may be coming to us for, for, for something else, um, unless you work at, at, at ASAP, like, like those of us that work with a specialty substance use population, if that's not your setting, um, it, it, by by not assessing for alcohol or um, illicit substance use, we could be missing some of the individuals that are falling into uh, these percentages that are reporting um, um, having those needs. The other thing to recognize is that that of the people who report the need for substance use disorder treatment that need to come and, and be placed on a, on a recommended medication or receive psychotherapy specific to their use disorder, um, uh, not that many who, who need it are actually receiving, um, receiving treatment. So there's a big discrepancy between those who, who need the service and those that are actually able to access that service. So, so what does that mean? Well, there's there's a number of things that that we could say explain why there's you know people are not necessarily going into the training to work with this population. There's still tremendous stigma around substance use disorders, um, and so in many uh, many communities, particularly rural communities in 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 our state, really lack um, specialty substance use providers. So that means that a, a lot of the intervention falls on primary care providers, general practitioners. Um, even people that are being seen in, in emergency rooms uh, across the state. So, so that means that um, there really is a necessity for, for universal screening to be applied and assessment to be applied um, to be able to catch these patients and then be able to get them to either the right level of care or provide um, what is avail available level of care uh, to address those, those use conditions. Um, so, so there's a lot of opportunity here if we start to look at um, applying those screening procedures to every, every medical setting where patients might hit. It's the best way of sort of determining where, where they are at that point in time and what may be um, the next step for them. So, so screening um, really helps us to understand what it is that the patient, um, uh, what, what their needs may be, to have an effective conversation around those needs, and then to talk about the right types of services that are both available to them or accessible um, to, to help address that, ideally address uh, those needs before they get to such a severe level that they, they absolutely need to come to a specialty treatment location like ASAP. So to be able to identify those folks and intervene early. The other thing that screening provides as just sort of a standard of care, regardless of setting, is it gives us an opportunity to track symptoms over time and to adjust our treatment accordingly. So it gives us a, a metric that we can use um, starting at baseline and then throughout treatment to see is this person uh, making improvements or declining um, and, and when we know if we could shift them to a, a lower level of care. Um, I think that it's important to ground kind of using universal screening in the history of how we've done this historically. Um, so when we look at, at our past and, and how we've applied different screening or assessment um, approaches to this population, 
Uh, we tend to see uh, two patterns arising, both of which have had um, uh, some research done on them to show they're really not the most effective way of, a, of addressing the needs um, of a substance uh, use disorder population. So whether they have a diagnosis or they don't have a diagnosis, um, historically they, they've come in due to either complications, so the consequences of their use, um, whether that's an emergency room setting or a primary care setting, they're coming in with some sort of health or psychological crisis, they're being um, treated, typically referred to uh, a higher level of care, like a, um, a, a, an RTC or an IOP. Um, and then they're discharged as soon as uh, they, there is a level of abstinence that's achieved. But then as soon as relapse hits, there's no treatment throughout that relapse period. And so when relapse hits, then it results in an increase in those treatment complications. So, so from either perspective, we're sort of seeing this pattern of patients coming to us in crisis, treating them during that crisis period, and then um, not having a continuum of care to uh, help keep them at, at that uh, state where they've, they've achieved some gains. So then, uh, so then they end up decompensating and returning back to treatment only in that, that heightened state of crisis. So what we wanna get to as a community, what's really recommended is to start to think about um, a screening and assessment uh, procedure that allows us to look at all of the different dimensions um, that uh, are part of uh, why somebody ends up with the use disorder, um, what maintains that condition, and then um, what's gonna exacerbate that condition. So looking at all of those different dimensions and coming up with um, a continuum of treatment that is gonna address um, their, their problems, their priorities, monitor their progress and help them step up or step down on that continuum, but to keep them in long-term care. So that sort of chronic condition management approach. So um, how do we begin to think about this is to think about treating these patients um, across that continuum of care, which is the, the, the transition, whether it's between providers or different levels of, of intensity. But as patients move across those different providers for, for different specialty needs, um, so they, for instance, might see a therapist and might see a psychiatrist for med management or might see a their primary care provider for med management and might see a, a counselor for some of their um, psychosocial needs and then a peer support. So those are different um, levels in that, in that continuum. But then they might also uh, go from different levels of intensity. So they might start at a medically managed sort of detox location and then step down to a residential treatment or IOP level and then step down to outpatient and then step down to peer or community level resource. And depending on where their symptoms are, kind of move up and down that continuum. Well, within each of um, both with the provider and level of acuity, we want to be thinking about how we're treating these patients from an episode of care model. So episodes of care are defined as, um, as a, a, a specific um, a period of time where you're, you're, you're highly focused on, on a, a set of treatment goals, and then we reassess. And so the screening and assessment procedures apply to help us determine what episode of care is needed for a patient at any given moment, and then to be able to reassess, adjust that treatment plan, and then move them throughout the continuum. So, so those are some important models to think about where screening and assessment can, can really fit. The other thing to keep in mind is not everybody, this is, this is really specific to treating um, the use disorder itself. The other thing to keep in mind is, is if we're not working at a substance use disorder specialty location, um, we're, we're embedded in um, a general practice, primary care, emergency department, um, to recognize that we can use screening and assessment procedures to kind of figure out who is going to need that, that level of, of specialty treatment and who could be handled at our level or actually lower. And so if we use this, um, a universal screening um, tool like the Audit C or, um, or the DAST 10 or 20, which I'll show you here in a little bit, um, if we use a universal screener like that, it can help us to, to um, tier where patients are falling. And you can see that, that statistically, the, in a general population, the majority of people screened are gonna fall into low risk 
or, or a no risk category, which means they don't use substances at all. So that's the vast majority in a general population setting are not going to need targeted intervention. But, but, but there is a percentage, about 9% that are gonna fall into a risky category, 8% that are gonna fall into a harmful category. Those are the folks that we might be able to intervene early and prevent from getting to that severe dependent level where they're gonna need specialty treatment. So if we know that specialty treatment is limited or access to it is limited, um, especially here in the state of New Mexico, um, then really catching folks at that risky or harmful level and trying to help them adjust their use patterns at that level um, can be really helpful of preventing some of those more severe consequences and engaging um, with treatment only when they're kind of at that crisis point. Um, so there are two models that I want to go over with you that can be used to sort of tying all of this together. One is the um, ASAM assessment criteria, which stands for Addiction Society or American Society of Addiction Medicine. Um, there's a specialty ASAM training out there that folks can get access to if they're not familiar with this. Um, or haven't been trained in using this, but this is a nice all-inclusive um, assessment model that is uh, compliant with DSM-5, and it, it looks at all of those biopsychosocial dimensions um, to help us figure out what the patient in front of us is gonna benefit most from and make that matching determination for them. Um, the other nice thing about ASAM is that it has some specific pullouts for, um, other, other types of substance use issues like tobacco use or gambling um, and some uh, population specific pullouts. So if we're working within a criminal justice setting or a mandated population, if we're working with geriatric or old or seniors, um, or if we're, we're working with um, new parents, people that have young children. So New Mexico uh, adopts the, the ASAM criteria. So our BHSD um, would like for everybody to be using this as the assessment model to help determine um, placement. And this is a, a visual of what this looks like. So you would go through a universal screening. Everybody gets screened. People who are positive on the screen will then go on to be given an, an ASAM assessment. That assessment determines the diagnosis and the severity of the use disorder. And then it goes through their readiness and their relapse potential and looks at these six different uh, dimensions. So intoxication and withdrawal, what are their, um, their medical needs, emotional behavioral needs, treatment acceptance or resistance. So kind of how ready or willing are they for the type of uh, intervention that's gonna be recommended? What is their relapse potential? And then what's the, their current recovery, uh, what's the current environment look like? And then what is the recommended recovery environment gonna be? And then that um, transitions to being able to place them at a level of care so that we're matching them appropriately and we're not sending people to a high level of care when in fact that, that's not what they need. And for some populations, particularly adolescents, that can make them worse if we send them to an RTC when that's not where they should, not where they should be. Um, or we make a decision to send them to too low of a level of care. So we say, you know, contact your, your peer support um, or go to a 12-step a, a group when actually they do need something like, like um, intensive outpatient, right? So we're not making the right, right uh, match decision. That can have some pretty significant uh, consequences for the patient that, that we're looking at. So the nice thing about uh, using something like the ASAM model is uh, it lines up with that episode of care and continuum of care um, uh, process so that patients can move up and down from sort of acute detox, medically managed to outpatient um, and then below outpatient would be a community uh, level standard. And it also lines up with our, um, our, our billing codes. So you can see these numbers correspond to um, uh, how, we, how we code things for different uh, levels of treatment. There's also some good data that really supports using ASAM for that matching decision because we see much worse outcome in terms of uh, retention and engagement, which are two things we're always trying to work on uh, with patients. So here's one study that shows the difference between a mismatch case patient. So that means they were either recommended to go to a higher level or a lower level than what they needed and matched patients um, across um, the, the whole population um, those with a stimulant use disorder and those with an opiate use disorder. And you can see um, 
that uh, that there there were some some negative outcomes associated. Uh, so they they were less likely to engage with treatment if they were not matched correctly. And the same thing here with retention in treatment, showing that um, that if we undermatch or we overmatch, we don't get um, as good of, a, of an outcome and we are unable to really help them step down to the appropriate level of care as part of that continuum. So, so there's some good data that supports using a model like ASAM uh, uh, if this isn't something you're not already using. Another model that pulls in screening and, and, and assessment is the SBIRT model. This is something that's, that has been applied in emergency room settings, primary care settings, inpatient, uh, med medical inpatient units. Um, and this stands for screening, brief intervention and referral for treatment. And so this means everybody gets that universal screening. It's standardized across the population using um, a, a standardized screening tool like the audit or the DAST. Um, it can occur at, at any point in which the patient hits that healthcare setting. Uh, if we only see them once a year for their annual checkup, it should absolutely happen at that annual checkup. If we see them at intake, it should happen at intake. There are some, some sort of rules that are, that are guided by SBIRT. Um, and then if a patient is positive on the screen, then they're provided in that moment, a 10 to 15 minute, what's called brief intervention, which is a, a structured conversation uh, which is used to help patients think about that the risky behaviors, they're falling into that risky or heavy use category, to talk about that, to come up with a short-term plan, and then to make a, a decision um, if a referral for treatment, that sort of next step is warranted. And then they use um, that, that leveling criteria to determine what would be the type of referral. So not everybody it isn't a one size fits all referral. It's still a matched referral. So based on your score, it's recommended that, you know, we, you would consider something like an intensive outpatient program or going to continue to follow up with, with me, but follow up, you know, once a month instead of uh, once every six months. So that referral is individualized based on um, how that brief intervention goes. So here is the, um, the kind of recommended six steps that you would go through in doing a brief intervention within the SBIRT model. So you're using the screening tool to guide the conversation that you have with the patient to talk about um, sort of their willingness to change, what, what would they be interested in changing at this point? Are they even aware of the, the risks of their current use pattern? So this is really intended to sort of catch patients that are not already presenting to your office, already telling you that they're in that severe use um, category, that, that they need help for their use. This is to catch people that may be unaware that, that what they're engaging in is potentially risky or could lead to harm down the road. There's a lot of apps and tools available for applying the SBIRT model. Uh, SAMHSA has a lot of, um, has an SBIRT toolkit available that you can download free online if you're interested in this model. So this is a visual that shows you everybody gets universal screening. The screening determines which category of risk they fall into. And then the category of risk uh, tells you uh, what, what intervention would be needed. So if they're low risk, you just keep assessing annually or whatever your, your uh, routine uh, point of contact is. If they're moderate risk, then we would do that brief intervention and provide them some education about that risk and see what they're willing to kind of work on there. If they're kind of start leaning more towards that high risk category, then we may do um, uh, more of an MI or, or MET strategy in that brief intervention along with the education. And then if they're falling into the severe category, then we would discuss a follow-up to either a specialty level of treatment or, or whatever would be the appropriate um, level of care for addressing that, that use condition. So those are the models. Now let's, let's um, kind of talk about what are some of the tools that could be used uh, regardless of which model. So the first thing to, to think about is, is we're talking about universal screening. What, is, uh, what does that mean? And what is the difference between screening and assessment? So, so screening in general is to help us target any unhealthy or problematic condition. It, it, we could use mental health uh, universal screeners to, to look at um, depression or anxiety or suicide. Like we use these universal screeners to kind of figure out what is the, the unhealthy or problematic um, risk it's showing up for that individual. And so we do the same thing when, when it comes to substance use, that there are universal screeners that can be applied to catch both alcohol and illicit substance use. Our goal is to detect that, that whole spectrum from low risk to high risk, and to be able to talk about what, what would follow. 
So screening should really occur at intake for everybody um, if we're doing a universal screening process. And it should occur um, uh, at, at a significant time points. So usually between six to 12 months, we wanna re-screen because some things could have changed. Um, ideally, you're doing both the substance use disorder screening as well as mental health um, screening, um, as well as uh, suicide, uh, homicide risk screening. So those are kind of the universal things that we'd be giving to everybody. They're brief, they're usually um, self-directed and um, they can be, be done in almost any setting. Clinicians can do it with, uh, with the patient or patients can fill it out while they're waiting in the waiting room. And we just kind of use that to sort of see what is the initial state. We can also use those same screeners um, as a means of tracking improvement over time. So you don't just have to do it every six months, you could do it every time you see the patient to sort of see, are they getting better? Are they getting worse? Um, and it really helps us to assist with that improved match. Are we making an appropriate referral when needed? Now, assessment should happen after screening if the screen is positive. So if the screen is positive, then we're going to go into our um, uh, H&P or our typical assessment procedure, where we're going to dig into that topic with more detail um, to really figure out, do they meet criteria for a mental health or substance use disorder to rule in and rule out certain things and, um, and then make a really targeted treatment plan for that individual. So with screeners, we have a number that are publicly available. So I've given you a list of kind of the ones that are in the list um, uh, on the uh, SAMHSA website for uh, public domain uh, evidence-based um, uh, evidence screening tools. So um, I'll go through a couple here, but I'll probably move pretty quick uh, and just talk about the ones that are most commonly used. Um, so the CAGE was one of our first screeners. It's just specific for alcohol. It's a real quick and dirty four question, um, yes, no assessment tool. So we don't see this used as often because it doesn't tend to collect a lot of information, um, but, uh, but it is still out there and available. What we see more often used is the audit, the audit C. So that's the alcohol use disorder identification test. It was developed by the WHO from the CAGE screener. Um, it has a, a reportable score that's different for women and men based on um, a recommended um, uh, drinking levels. Um, and the main difference between the, the, the C and the full audit is um, the audit sees the first three questions. So it has a skip feature. If they're never or one to two on any of the first three questions, you don't have to ask the rest because it assumes that they're not going to have these other issues. However, if they are um, a three for a woman or a four for, for men on, the, on the, the first three, then you want to go ahead and ask the rest of the questions. And you can see it gives us a Likert uh, scoring system here rather than just a yes, no. It tells us um, of frequency of these issues. And so we get uh, a little more specificity in terms of level of risk for alcohol use. So this is a really good instrument. And I highly, highly recommend people, even if you're working with someone that has um, an opiate use disorder or a stimulant use disorder, um, to continue to use the audit because alcohol is still the number one issue that we have in the world, as well as here in New Mexico. And, and so um, patients may not report or may under report their, their alcohol use. And if we just give them a routine screen like this, we can, we can suss that out if there is a, a separate alcohol issue that we wanna be looking at. Um, the DAST is another really uh, nice tool. It's called the Drug Abuse Screening Test. It comes in both a 10 and 20 item version. The 10 has just as much um, a, a, a good validity to it as the 20 items. So um, feel free to, to use the 10. There is also an adult and an adolescent version. And the nice thing about the DAS is it aligns with ASAM criteria, uh, very the same way that the, the audit does. So um, the audit is only getting at alcohol, but the DAST gets at negative consequences associated with any type of use. So if you know that your patient is using um, uh, cannabis or they're using stimulants, or they're using uh, any number of other substances, the DAST can be applied to get an idea of the level of severity of that use based on the consequences that they're experiencing in their life. One of the, the more sophisticated tools that's out there and available now is the NM Assist. It stands for NIDA Modified Alcohol Smoking and Substance Involvement Screening Test. This is a really cool instrument um, that can be done either in its web-based format. So it is an interactive tool that you could launch on an iPad or, or a computer if you have access to that, 
or you can um, you can print it out and you can give it to them paper if that if that's just what's needed in your area. But the nice thing about it is it also aligns with ASAM and in and expert. So it kind of combines the best of, best of both worlds and that it will um, screen for level of risk tell you the recommended um, level of intervention based on that person's risk. And then it will follow up with some, some resources or some statements that a provider can say that fall within that kind of doing a brief intervention in that moment. Um, it also hits all of the substance classes. So it has a, um, sorry, I don't have the picture. I've given you the link here to go to it. But it, the, the, first, the first page is eight questions on different substance classes and then if they're no to, they, they only say yes to marijuana and opiates, then the following questions are only going to be addressing marijuana and opiates um, versus if they say, yes, I, I am using all of these substances, then it's going to ask them specific questions to all of those substances. So it's, it's really nice in how it can individualize and sort of target the range of um, substance use behavior for patients. Other universal screeners that can be applied as part of routine care, which can be very helpful, are these um, what would fall into the category of like symptom trackers specifically. So the COWS and the CEWA, the Clinical Opiate Withdrawal Scale and the um, a Clinical Institute Withdrawal for, for Alcohol Scale, these can be really helpful for determining um, you know, what level of medical intervention is needed when somebody's appropriate to start a medication, when they might need medically managed detox, um, because this is looking at what are the present symptoms regarding their withdrawal. So these are things that, that could be used um, as, as part of making those decisions. And then um, lastly, another screen that isn't subjective, that doesn't have to do with the patient self-report, which is a really helpful tool to apply to, to um, kind of that, that universal screening, is getting UDMs on folks, because this tells us what might they might not be reporting um, and can help us track uh, what's going on if they're in routine care. It can also um, uh, help us uh, understand if there's something that could be contra, um, contraindicated to the medications that we're prescribing, what other interventions we might need to apply if, if we see that um, they're not telling us that they have stimulants, but there's stimulants showing up in their UDA. So just looking at the uh, urine detection windows and having some means of doing UDAs at a frequency that allows us to kind of um, uh, keep an eye on some of these other things. Now, I wanted to give you um, information on, um, so we know the vast majority of our folks are going to have comorbid conditions. So other universal screeners that can be really helpful are things like getting a, a quality of life, um, so the WHOQUAL brief is, is a general quality of life, general health instrument that's really helpful and can be very useful, especially for having uh, treatment planning discussions. Um, and then using things uh, like the patient stress questionnaire, which pulls in the PHQ-9, the GAD-7, the PCPTSD, which um, is like just a five question on potential PTSD symptoms um, and, and the audit. So that's a nice instrument that pulls all of those into just a two page handout that patients can fill out in their waiting room. Other things that could be helpful are things like the WHODAS, which is a functionality assessment um, provided by the, the WHO. And then there's just the, the QL, which is another a briefer quality of life than, than the WHOQAL. And you can find all of those at this link um, on SAMHSA as, as um, uh, potential screening tools. Now, assessments, I'm not going to go into too much because I think this is part of what, what you all do. So once somebody's screened, then they're going to go on to get a comprehensive assessment. The one thing that I do want to highlight, which I think we forget a lot about, particularly with our patient population, is making sure to include as part of doing comprehensive assessment, a collateral interview. And if anybody would like um, a, a templated collateral interview or or ideas for questions that you could routinely ask and I can get that to you. Um, I do think that if we're not assessing somebody in that person's life that can give us to the pie when it comes to actively treating uh, the person in front of us so too, that's in their life now, that we can get some information 
to what they're seeing, what they're viewing um, of, of uh, structured assessments. Um, if, if that's something that you, you need some assistance with doing all of these components, you don't have an interview or a template already, um, here are some that are available that are set up to collect all of that assessment information in a structured clinical interview. So there are, I've provided you with links and, and information there. Okay, so any questions about screening and assessment?